look, you're going to analyze the survey results. You log into your survey monkey, you see 114 people completed the survey, and you're going to look at all the questions and answers. And then uh, you're going to focus on which here would be the most surprising in my industry. And it might be, well, you know, uh, I think the, you know, the biggest one might be that uh, 82% of people in our industry feel that AI is going to replace them within five years. You're going to write the press release that says, in a recent survey I did of members of such and such trade association, uh, we determined that 82% felt this way. And then you take that press release, you're going to issue it to the uh, to the media uh, using uh, e-releases, for example, or you could go directly to the wire and, and you know pay a lot more. Uh, and then it goes to the journalist. It's in their feed. And when a journalist sees a survey, they're like, wow, number one, it's timely. Uh, the data is very fresh. And so uh, they, they know that uh, people like fresh data. We've curated a vast network of business experts ready to address your company's most pressing challenges. From corporate growth strategy to leadership, marketing strategy, sales strategy, branding, customer relations, technology, AI, IT security, and beyond, we connect you to the best experts for your needs. Reach out to us for more information or schedule a call at growandlearn.org to explore how we can support you. Welcome to Grow and Learn, Curious Minds. Today, I'm speaking to a PR expert who's especially useful for small and medium-sized companies that need publicity, visibility, and we want to know more about PR. Is it effective? How to use it? What's in it for us? Hi, Miki. Welcome. Hi. Glad to be here. <laughs> lovely, lovely glasses. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> for those of uh, for those of you listening only, Mickey has uh, rainbow glasses, but they're really cool. <laughs> Thank you, um, Mickey. How did you get into PR? Tell us a bit about you, your story. So, so I went to uh, graduate school to be a poet. I did a master's of fine arts in creative writing uh, with an emphasis in poetry, and my career plan was to wait tables and write poetry. And so after I graduated. I guess around 27, 28 years ago, I uh, I did that first summer and realized that uh, waiting tables is physically and psychologically exhausting. And uh, my back hurt, my, my knees hurt, and uh, I just decided I wanted a safe office job. I applied at a lot of places and um, got accepted at a telecom research firm. Uh, I was employee number three, which meant I did a lot of different things. Uh, but one of those was they wanted me to figure out press releases and uh, to write them and send them to the media. And so I did that. You know, we had a lot of great data and I thought it would be easy. And it wasn't. Um, I was sending out releases by fax at the time and almost nobody was responding. And so I started looking at what journalists write about. And I noticed that they really love a story arc. And there's not a story arc in numbers. So I had to bring the story out that's behind the numbers. And what is a story example, arc? I'm sorry, I'm not into, into the terminology. Right. So a story arc is uh, just a natural story. Uh, people, since the beginning of time, tell a story and it usually leads up to a climax and then it comes down. And uh, that, that's pretty much a story arc. And, you know, it, it it's something that children naturally naturally do once they start telling stories at a young age. We've always done it. And in all stories sort of follow a story arc. And uh, they always have. Uh, it, it, it's uh, just one of those almost innate things that I think uh, makes us human. And so noticing that, I went back at the data. And I think the data that I had at that time that what we were interested in was uh, telecom traffic between the United States and Caribbean countries. And I noticed that one country had more traffic uh, inbound and outbound with the United States than all the other countries almost combined. Um, and so I explored why that was and discovered that that country uh, had become the call center for 1-900 numbers, which I guess 27 years ago was was really big. You'd call this uh, number and they would charge you uh, a fee per minute and they would usually disclose what it was uh, in writing. But also when you call it, it says you're going to be charged uh, 75 cents a minute and you could get your horoscope done or, uh, you know, pet advice. Um, there would even be, you know, people who would help with, uh, uh, you know, love and rope 
romance advice and things like that. So uh, all kinds of things that, uh, you know, this was way pre-internet that uh, people would seek advice and uh, uh, consultations on. And so I thought that was intriguing. So I wrote a press release focusing on that element of the data. And I got picked up immediately by the Financial Times, The Economist, The Wall Street Journal, The Washington Post, and three telecom trade publications. And I went, wow, that's pretty impressive. So I continued to do um, press releases um, that uh, looked at anomalies and data and figured out what the story was behind it. And then I would share that story. And again, they would get picked up uh, again and again. We would get uh, a lot of uh, customers. We get a lot of uh, leads. We get a lot of people calling us. Um, it was really good recognition. In fact, uh, one of the things we discovered was that in some countries, uh, uh, particularly uh, we were looking at Asian and uh, I think South and Latin America, uh, when there was a increase in uh, traffic uh, from those certain countries there to industrialized countries, it would usually mean that there would be economic growth in those countries that followed two to three years. And uh, wow, that's we started a, that's getting observation. Yeah. Right. So all of a sudden we started getting orders from hedge funds and investment bankers and all these other types. So it was really great for us. And I just felt like this is such an amazing thing I've discovered. You know, I, I would love to help other people do that. And around the same time, uh, as I was faxing, which was very time intensive, uh, we would get calls from journalists saying, hey, uh, we got an email address. Can you email us in the future rather than faxes? And I'd go, sure. And I just, you know, a light bulb went off and said, I could just get journalist email addresses and, uh, you know, uh, be a matchmaker. So I uh, reached out to journalists on their websites uh, where a lot of them just posted their email address and also message boards and asked if I could send them press releases. And, uh, you know, 27 years ago, journalists didn't have the problem that they have today, which is like too much email. So mm -hmm. almost all of them said, yes, send me stuff. And so I, that's how I started e-releases about a year later uh, and uh, in October of 1998. And uh, over the years, uh, I was approached by PR Newswire. They liked how I was helping small businesses and entrepreneurs and startups and authors and said, uh, hey, uh, we would like to support you in some way. Uh, what do you think about maybe adding a city or state uh, newswire distribution along with your customers? And I, I really pushed back and, and uh, said that, you know, my customers really deserve national uh, newswire distribution. And, you know, they charge $1,600 uh, to move a 600 word press release. So it, it was really big price difference between that and what I was charging my customers, which I think was around $300 at the time. And so uh, despite that, you know, we continue to talk. Uh, one of the things that we noticed was that, uh, or I noticed was that they had an editorial team that uh, worked overnight, but they weren't very busy. They had to be there in case there was breaking news, a recall, an accident, or they needed to get some news to Asian markets. And so I suggested that I start setting up my releases and scheduling them for next business day. Uh, and as a result, they could set them up overnight and it wouldn't cost them any additional labor because they have idle time overnight. And at that point, they said, OK, let's try to make this work. And um, as a result, every press release that goes out through e-releases gets a national newswire distribution of a PR newswire, uh, which is the oldest and largest newswire. But you don't have to pay sixteen to eighteen hundred dollars. Uh, it's uh, probably about a third of the price uh, going through us uh, because of uh, their discount to help small businesses. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. So immediately after the um, uh, telecom analytics company, you started working with small and medium sized companies. So you moved away from telecom analytics and story creation. Yeah, oh, well, the company I worked for, e even though it was in the telecom industry, was a, a bona fide small business. It was a startup ah, with, with uh -huh. three employees when I was there. Uh, we did grow to about five or six when I left. I think right now it's about a dozen employees. So it still it qualifies as a small business, but uh, I, I saw how valuable uh, PR could be for that business. Um, that being said, there is a lot of criticism of press releases. And a lot of people believe that press releases don't work. And I will be completely honest and say that probably 97% of press releases that go out, um, even over the newswire, do not generate earned media. Um, they are correct. 
But what I will say is I see uh, 10,000 to 12,000 press releases go out every year with my clients. And I see patterns among the 3% of press releases that do get earned media. And if you uh, focus on those types of releases uh, and build a campaign of six to eight press releases, you will probably get at least one or two of those press releases to generate earned media. And like I said, you know, all you need is one uh, 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 to hit gold for it to really drive a lot of traffic and sales and credibility your way. Um, you know, when a journalist writes an article about you, the earned media, it is like uh, almost like an implied endorsement. It's like social proof and it's a huge credibility flag. Uh, it is a signal of trust, uh, you know, and when people read about someone in an article, they often get an emotional response, this amplification of feeling good for this company, they root for them. And as a result, the traffic that you get uh, often converts very highly. And those customers tend to be more loyal and less cost sensitive. They really uh, want to do business with the company that they read about. And, you know, they really feel that sort of, uh, uh, you know, uh, strong emotional ties to your business and that's a a type of clout uh that uh and and trust that you get uh that you don't get any other way uh it's not unusual uh for clients to sometimes tell me that they got you know 400 visitors uh from an article that linked to them and over 200 of them converted um, in most of those cases, it's a consumer product that's usually like under $50. And they're just like, is that possible? And I point out that probably a lot more people read the article and did not click through. But of the people who click through, yeah, you know, converting half of them is not uh, out of the realm of possibility, especially in a consumer market uh, with something that's pretty affordable. And, uh, you know, uh, you know, they, they tell me that their best landing pages for pay traffic don't even convert at 5%. So that's the real value, value of earned media. It really is something that uh, for a lot of people, it doesn't trigger uh, the problems that we have with advertising. So many of us are so skeptical of ads that even when we click through an ad, we're looking for a reason to hit the back button. We're looking for a reason to get out of there. Uh, we're very distrustful. Where with earned media, it's just the opposite. We're very trustful. Mm -hmm. So it's not like when you're reading an article, people don't notice that it's a paid article you think that it's also a hidden ad well, it's, it's it's not a paid it's not a paid not article paid that journalist wasn't paid to write about you that journalist uh got to look at thousands maybe hundreds of press releases and chose to write about you there was no money involved uh you paid a fee to be on the newswire and the reason for that is that uh, journalists are busy um they are unfortunately being asked to do more with less and so they go to the two biggest newswires in the u.s it's largely a duopoly um, there's pr newswire and there's business wire outside of that there are no real true newswires that journalists actually use and so they fish in these two ponds and so if you're not in those two ponds um uh outside of you know directly pitching them uh as a pr firm would do uh, ideally with someone they have a connection with um it's really the only way to sort of reach these journalists so uh there, there is no payment involved uh, there's no consideration uh the journalist uh gets to see a feed that they can customize for their industry uh, like exclude certain keywords if they don't cover uh certain elements like Maybe they do fashion, but they don't do retail fashion like, you know, uh, normal uh, consumer brands. They may, you know, say exclude anything that mentions Target, uh, JCPenney, things like that, so that they're looking at a more uh, uh, better a curated feed that better represents who they are. But, you know, when they go through that and look and choose someone, it wasn't there's no money consideration uh, done. It's done based on what they feel would be the best story for their audience. Mm -hmm. And uh, what kind of information do the companies include in the in the feed? Is it it's not already article clearly because the no it, no. no it's yeah. it, usually it's a, a press release consists of a headline 
There may be a subhead, and then there's the body of the press release. And it usually works from uh, an inverted pyramid with the most important information first. And then as you get to the bottom, you have less important information. There might be a boilerplate. We call that a, an about section at the end. It usually is like about company, and it's like a paragraph that you can recycle in all of your press releases that gives a short elevator pitch of who you are. And then you'd have your uh, media contacts. So it's usually a name email address and phone number. And a phone number is really so important because journalists, when they're on deadline and at the last minute, one of their managing editors says, hey, I want a clarification on this. Uh, are you sure that this is right? Or uh, I, I, you know, could you get uh, uh, their perspective on X, Y, and Z? And so right under the gun, before it's getting ready to be published, uh, they need to be able to reach out to you and get a response. So it's really important for uh, you to have a, a, a good uh, phone number there. Most people list their personal cell phone uh, and they will answer it even in the evening because they don't want to lose a story. Uh, but sometimes they'll post the work number and uh, an after hours number as well. Uh, but uh, it, it is uh, uh, largely that's it. Um, these things aren't fine writing. Uh, you're just writing uh, to get the information uh, to the journalists uh, that all the information that they would need to write a story. Uh, you know, they, they will often sometimes go to your website, maybe find out a little bit more about you. Uh, but you really want to try to do a good job of having all the necessary elements for them to write an article in the press release. Mm -hmm. And uh, they're usually between 400 to 600 words. Um, I think 500 is a natural uh, maximum for most small businesses. Uh, there are instances where it could be longer if you have a lot of technical information and you're really trying to target, um, say, industry trade publications in which that information would be useful. Uh, I could see it getting a little bit longer. Uh, and outside of that, publicly traded companies have disclosures and financial stuff that they have to issue that's longer. But for anybody that's not public, it, there's really not a strong reason to be much bigger than uh, 500 words. Mm -hmm, I see. And what is your role in this whole process? Well, what do you do exactly? <laughs> so at, at e-releases, uh, we uh, take the releases, uh, we answer any questions anybody has. A lot of times people will come to us and have maybe tried other online services. There's a lot of companies on the internet that do syndication where they'll take the release and they'll replicate it on a bunch of websites. That even happens with the news wires, but it's not important. It's not earned media. It doesn't get a lot of people looking at it. And the people that do look at it, you know, they know it's a press release, it's not an article, and it's not really attached to a brand, uh, like a news outlet or a journalist who wrote it. Um, and so I, I generally avoid that. Um, but we take the releases, we make sure it's in the proper style for the newswire. Uh, we give any guidance if we see any like uh, big mistakes. Uh, you know, sometimes we get people saying that an event is on Wednesday, January 19th, and we look up in January 19th to Thursday. So we have to make sure that uh, either the day of the week is right or the date uh, is wrong. Uh, those are the types of things we look for. We look for grammatical errors. Uh, sometimes if someone wants us to review a press release, uh, uh, you know, and, and they send it to us, uh, we'll you know, get back to them in a day or two with some uh, tips or ideas uh, or what we feel about that press release. We'll do that for anybody, whether they use us or not. Just allow like one to two business days uh, for our editorial team to review it and get back to you with it. Uh, but basically, we just support people through the process um, where their uh, uh, you know, point of contact uh, as far as like the press release. And we're also really big in education. Um, I mentioned that, you know, 97% of press releases fail. Um, I, I have a whole entire masterclass where I teach people about the 3% of press releases that succeed. And uh, if uh, any of your listeners are interested, it's less than an hour long. And it's a really great place to get started because you can sort of brainstorm uh, strategic uh, press releases that would uh, be meaningful for your business. And it's at ereleases.com slash plan, P-L-A-N. And uh, it, it's completely free. And uh, it, yeah, there are some really great ones in there. Um, the one type of press release that I've never seen fail is to do a survey or study. And I walk you through that process. It's pretty straightforward uh, to do an industry survey or study. And, uh, you know, it, it's, uh, you know, 
I, I go through how I uh, format it in uh, SurveyMonkey. You take the link, and I I I accept that most people don't have enough contacts in their own industry to send it out to. But the good news is that in every industry, there are dozens, if not hundreds, of small and independent trade associations. And so pick one that sort of represents uh, your market, your industry best. Um, you don't want the large trade associations because they get lots of media attention and they usually are difficult to work with, but the small and independent ones that might have four or 500 members or you know a little over a thousand members, those are really good. So if you reach out to them and say, hey, could you send this link to your members in exchange for that, I will put you and uh, your organization in my press release that I'll be issuing over the wire. Two thirds of the time, the first association you approach will say yes. Um, you, you may have a little back and forth, but uh, if that's not there, you go to the next one and then uh, have them uh, send it out. Uh, you do tell them that the goal is to get at least 100 responses. And if you don't, I just go back to them and say, hey, we didn't quite get 100. We really need that for this to work. And I you know, hate for you to lose your opportunity to be in the press release. Could you send it again or maybe also send it through social media? And they really want it to succeed at that point. So they'll often do that. And uh, even if it gets close to 100, it's usually fine. Journalists don't seem to have a problem with that. Uh, you're going to review it, figure out what the biggest surprise, what was the biggest aha moment from the survey, and you want to focus the press release on that. For that reason, it's usually one to two questions of the survey that get focused on. But go ahead and build out a page on the website where you have all the questions and responses. And you're going to put a great quote in the press release of why you felt the numbers uh, of that issue turned out that way. Uh, you're providing your analysis. You're the author of the survey. Uh, and, uh, you know, as a result, uh, you'll get uh, um, earned media from that. Usually the least I've ever seen is four articles, but it was somebody in biometrics, which is a very specialized field. Um, but uh, the average is between eight and 14 articles when someone does a survey or a study. And these are earned media articles. Uh, and, you know, you authoring a survey also makes you look like an expert. So it's a really great way to sort of catapult you and uh, sort of give you that thought leadership and authority that uh, uh, really helps you stand out in your industry. Mm -hmm. when, when you contact these associations um, and they contact their members, I didn't quite understand what happens afterwards in the, in the step process. So the, the members respond, but how does the article reach the news outlets? Okay. So you're going to look, you're going to analyze the survey results. You log into your survey monkey, you see 114 people completed the survey and you're going to look at all the questions and answers. I usually like to do 12 to 16 questions. Um, I do four questions per page in survey monkey. So if someone stops halfway, you've got half the responses already captured. Um, and then uh, you're going to focus on which here would be the most surprising in my industry. And you may have to ask people, uh, colleagues, you know, what do you think is the biggest surprise in this uh, survey? And it might be, well, you know, uh, I think the, you know, the biggest one might be that uh, 82% of people in our industry feel that AI is going to replace them within five years. And so uh, you're going to take that question and that uh, number that a certain percentage felt that way, and you're going to build a press release around it. You're going to write the press release that says, you know, 82% of people in the whatever field you're in, uh, let, let's say you're uh, just trying to think of something like a uh, digital mar uh, marketing, uh, you know, 82% of people in digital marketing believe that AI is going to re replace them within five years. And then you say in a recent survey I did of members of such and such trade association, uh, we determined that 82% felt this way. Uh, and then you can talk about some of those fears that people have. And then a quote by you would be like, uh, you could, you could either agree with it and say, Hey, this is really, uh, showing that this is a real, concern or you could just say uh, uh be a little contrarian and say i think this is an overreaction i think that there's a lot of fears of the unknown uh, i don't think that ai is going to replace digital marketers but what i do believe is that you know uh in five years those who those digital marketers who don't know how to use ai 
are probably going to lose their job because uh, uh, it's going to probably be necessary for them to get their job done in a competitive market. And so uh, that's your quote, your your spin on the analysis. And then you take that press release, you're going to issue it to the uh, to the media uh, using uh, e-releases, for example, or you could go directly to the wire and, and you know pay a lot more. Uh, and then it goes to the journalist. It's in their feed. And when a journalist sees a survey, they're like, wow, number one, it's timely. Uh, the data is very fresh. And so uh, they, they know that uh, people like fresh data. And so also they know it's an interesting position. You're going to pick the the response that's going to be the biggest aha moment, the biggest surprise. And, you know, uh, how your industry feels about AI uh, uh, in the example I gave is, is one uh, that, that, that they know would probably interest their audience. And so they are going to write an article about that. And they're going to take the elements from the press release. Um, they're, you know, Hopefully you had a great quote uh, and they're going to include the quote. They're going to include some background on the information uh, and uh, and then that'll get published. And uh, generally several people publish these because they're very good, um, you know, because you picked, uh, uh, you know, what you felt was the most interesting response. And also you put your spin on it and uh, also it's, it's fresh data. So um, journalists are going to then write, you know, articles about it and that's how it gets done it's just a natural organic thing um you you don't write the article the journalists do and uh, they respond to it because they 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 know that their audience would love to know uh you know how your industry feels about uh this particular issue and uh your survey uh and and press release explores that i see and uh, if this is the highest percentage of picked up articles what what is it how how many of these let's say that write um an article following a, a questionnaire um how many are picked up are they all picked up by journalists so generally when uh, a client that i've coached through this process does a survey or study the average is they get between 8 and 14 earned media articles from that one press release mm -hmm. uh any Okay, so it doesn't matter if they're using the questionnaire or a different type of um, source for the for their article. For no, the, they have to be. Yeah. They have to be the source. They have to. Be. Yeah, yeah, they have yeah. to be the source. But I, uh, no matter if they use the questionnaire as a as an inspiration for writing the piece of content. Correct. The the, yeah. the the questionnaire will be the inspiration for it. Correct. Yes. 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 Uh huh. You so can you every... can use a, a different. Uh, uh, strategy that works uh, well, but not all the time is taking publicly available data and putting it together in an interesting way in a press release, but they don't, they don't have a pickup as high as that. Uh, yeah. With the survey and study, it's never failed. I, I We've never sent one out and it not get earned media. Uh, adding data that's publicly available Sometimes you will, uh, but it does increase your chances of getting picked up, but it, it's not a, a, a winner uh, in the yeah. case of doing a, sur a survey or study of your industry that you've authored, uh, then uh, I've, I've, I've never had that not get media pickup. Okay. Have you ever had um, like, a, how should I say? I mean, there have clearly been some clients of yours, some articles that haven't been picked up for earned media. And what were they? What what are the failing types? Okay, so the common failing ones are uh, announcing a new hire. Uh, a lot of people like to do a press release every time they hire someone. And really, I would only pay for a press release to go out if the person that was hired is a very high executive or they're really well known in the industry. Like this person is a veteran of you know, working 25 years in the industry, extremely respected, and you've lured them over to the board or uh, a vice president position or something like that, do that. But we get press releases every day that there's a new uh, secretary, there's a new assistant HR. And that's not really newsworthy enough for the media to be interested. And it certainly doesn't justify spending, you know, uh, the money with us of you know, 300 to $500. And so, uh, you know, it's certainly not $1,600 if you went directly to the newswire. Uh, you know, you'd be better off 
taking uh, a picture of the employee and writing a few sentences about them and not even having to do a press release and send that to your local newspaper, uh, send that to uh, maybe a couple of trade publications, uh, especially ones that have an on the move section that shows people moving around. Uh, you're not gonna have much difference in results than you know paying money to go over a release. Another common press, uh, press release that we get is a product launch press release. And in theory, it should be newsworthy, but a lot of people just say, here's our new product, here's a list of features, here's a link to learn more and to buy it. There's no story there. Mm -hmm. And so a journalist, you know, who likes to follow a story arc that rises to a climax and goes somewhere, there's nothing for them to do. And so the things that I would tell people is to go back in there and put a use case study, uh, you know. I, I'm pretty sure that everybody who's released a product or a service had people beta test it. Talk about that company. You know, this company uh, was uh, had losses of 4% annually and they used our logistics software solution. And within 90 days, they were achieving a 7% net profit and then get a quote by them talking about, wow, we were really shocked that, you know, just using uh, a piece of uh, software like this would make us so much more efficient and, you know, achieve such considerable savings. And so, uh, you know, that's a way to sort of have a story element within the press release. Um, you could also even support it with uh, publicly available data. I'd mentioned that. So like maybe you could talk about the fact that, uh, you know, figure out what the number is in your industry, but say, hey, you know, 87% of new transportation companies in our industry fail within the first five years, uh, often because they can't control their cost. And all of a sudden that shows the stakes of why a solution like yours might be really important. And so that those are ways to make that stand out. But many of the times the way that we we get those press releases, there's not a lot for journalists to work with. So they're just going to move on because it's mm -hmm. not a lot for them to build a story from. Uh, are your clients typically picked up by um, by online uh, channels, news channels, or are there also um, newspapers and magazines that use the, the yeah, press release so platform? Yeah, right. So uh, our people get picked up from print, online, uh, radio, TV, uh, even social media. Um, we uh, do uh, new product releases uh, for companies that are hitting grocery stores, um, snacks and stuff like that. And um, for example, there's a TikToker named Snackalator who does a weekly roundup of new snacks hitting shelves and all of his content and images come from press releases. And so uh, there's someone in social media who uses press releases uh, to get an advantage over everybody else that he gets access to this uh, uh, data before anybody else does because it's fresh, it's just released from the uh, the companies. Uh, so it, it really ha allows him to stand out as having this pipeline of data of being the first to announce all of these new products and trends. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Is there a trend that you're seeing that has been developing in recent uh, months or recent years regarding the type of content or the type of format that is being yeah. picked up? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Other than so, the question there. Great, great. So uh, there, there are trends that I see. I, I've seen a trend towards uh, uh, using uh, multimedia, specifically images. Um, you're allowed to include two images uh, with your press release. And uh, journalists are using them more and more because even uh, publications that are offline often have an online component. And they know that if you have a really engaging photo, that it's going to enhance the visitor experience and more people are going to um, uh, interact with your article as a result of it. And the trend that I've also seen is over the last 25 years is uh, it used to be that the images that you included with your press release were like perfect, professionally shot. You know, if it's a product, it's usually on blue velvet and well lit. People don't engage with those types of um, images anymore. What people want are candid shots. They want to see uh, an example of your uh, customer using the product in their office and mm -hmm. you know, me messy uh, desk in the background, all of that. You know, it doesn't have to be perfect. And so uh, people really do appreciate authenticity 
uh, in images. And so candid shots worked extremely well. Um, and I, I think that's really good too, because it, it takes away a barrier for small businesses that used to be there where you had to uh, really, you know, professionally shoot a product or, uh, uh, you know, uh, your, or, or something like that. So it is really nice that, uh, you know, the end users, the consumers are driving what people want and what people engage with are people that look like them, that office environments that look like their office environment. And so uh, the, you know, the, 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 the images that people used to use that are just, you know, uh, uh, the ones that people license and they're all perfectly shot. Uh, those are, are really not as important anymore and they don't work as effectively. I see. Mm -hmm. This makes, oh, I should remove this background then. Right. <laughs> Immediately. Yes. Yeah. If there's ever a choice to do candid photos over stock photos, uh, they, they always work well. Mm -hmm. I see. Uh, what what do you particularly enjoy about your job? I think what I enjoy is educating uh, my clients on what's working, um, trying to you know help them uh, navigate uh, PR and to focus on the type of PR that's more likely to yield them results. Um, it can really be transformative for businesses. Um, I, I've seen companies that uh, have gotten you know uh, a, a really strong pipeline of sales and authority through PR and have have really been able to launch themselves and to grow. Um, and it's a really effective way to sort of uh, communicate your business and your ideas to uh, actual buyers and consumers uh, through the media. Uh, you do have to navigate that. You don't get to control how an article is necessarily written. Um, so you may not ever be positioned as perfectly as you would be in marketing. Uh, but the end result is that generally the sales that you get uh, and uh, the conversions you get and the type of customer you get tend to be really strong customers uh, that are very loyal and convert very well. In addition to that, um, you know, taking these earned media that, that you do get, uh, these articles, uh, you can then take that link to that article and share it with your social media, um, share it with your customers and share it with your leads. And uh, the importance of that is that with customers, there's always churn. There's always a certain number of customers that just say, eh, we've used this person for four years. We should try someone else. And if they see that article, they get that signal of trust and get that little emotional response to it that, you know, they feel like, wow, this is, yeah, this is a great company. They're less likely to shop around. And for P uh, your leads, um, let's say you convert 20% of your leads, that's 80% that don't convert. It might be that, uh, you know, 10, uh, 10 or 20% of those uh, would have converted um, if they were just pushed a little bit more, like they might've been 48% of the way and they needed to get to 51% to convert. Um, maybe that article will do that, that credibility, that signal of trust, they read it, they see it. And all of a sudden, instead of 20% of your leads converts, maybe 30% of your leads converts. And again, that's not unusual. And uh, it, it, it is one of the magical things about earned media that, you know, it really gives you a great reputation. Uh, people think really highly of you and it does continue to uh, persist. So when you do get these articles and these opportunities, uh, be sure to record them. Um, there's uh, extensions for mo uh, most browsers, including Chrome, that'll take a perfect screenshot of the entire page from top to bottom uh, and preserve it either as an image or as a PDF. I usually do both. And, uh, you know, that way uh, you can, you can um, archive it on your website. Um, you can share links to the actual article. And if the article ever goes away, you can uh, link to the PDF, uh, for example. And so, uh, you know, it, it really is building a huge asset um, and, and it really does help you um, increase conversions. A lot of startups, uh, before they do paid advertising, um, they will do earned media and they will um, get... Uh, articles about them, and then they'll put the logos on their website, they'll link to the articles, and then they'll start paid advertising because they know that if they started paid advertising at the beginning, 
uh, let's say they convert at 5%, they know that if they get that earned media and these logos and signals of trust that net, and after they do paid advertising after that, it might convert at 10%. So it, it is a huge advantage when you get earned media. It really makes every aspect of marketing so much easier. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I can see how this makes perfect sense. Um, and well, you, you mentioned the... Um... The conversion is very high for products that are at a specific uh, price cap, let's say 50 bucks. But what about service businesses? Uh, how do they perform? What right. Is so, yeah. right. So it depends on your lead time. Generally, if you are uh, service based or it's a B2B type product that generally has a longer sell cycle, uh, you will still see an increase in conversions, but it might take long. If your normal uh, sales cycle is six months of education and you know we're walking through the contract and the scope of the the uh, the needs of the client and stuff like that, you will usually see an accelerated sales cycle. It might be three months because they've really they're not they're not looking at anyone else. They they've got you in their sights and they want to work with you. Um, so they are uh, still great customers, very loyal. Uh, less price sensitive and uh, but but it does take a little bit longer to see it because the, uh, it, your sell cycle is going to be a component in there. Mm -hmm. Mickey, I thoroughly enjoyed this conversation. It was very, very informative for me. Um, how can people reach you and um, maybe you can share a bit more about also the um, the, the the free, book that you were was it, the, sure. was it a book or it's a, a master class it's masterclass. a video training mm -hmm. yeah so uh my website is ereleases.com uh, all of my social media is on the lower right of the page uh, we also have at the bottom of the page a new customer special that saves you 30 percent uh coming in uh the free master class that i mentioned is a great place to start it's a small commitment of less than an hour i, I i've got so many 10, 20 hour classes that I bought in the past and never completed because it's it's such a big ask. So I made this very small and digestible and it's at ereleases.com slash plan, P-L-A-N. And I just like to close by saying that a lot of people believe that I'm just too small right now for uh, PR. Uh, I, I'm not big enough uh, to do it. And what I would say is that, you know, being small, uh, or, you know, being, uh, even, you know, uh, uh, you know, not where you'd like to be is an advantage. Um, journalists like to be seen as curators. Um, they often get accolades from their audience when the journalist writes about a company or a service or a, a product that they've never seen before. And likely those are small businesses, uh, or startups. Uh, and as a result, uh, journalists like to uh, put the spotlight on these types of companies. They don't love putting the spotlight on big, well-funded companies because mm -hmm. that's kind of expected and everyone sort of knows them. So, uh, you know, don't be deterred uh, by your size. It really can be an advantage when it comes to PR. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Mickey. Very You're very welcome. Thank you for listening to Grow and Learn. We hope that you found our podcast informative, engaging, and inspiring. Our mission is to help you keep growing and learning, and we hope that our conversations and insights have provided you with practical advice and useful perspectives. If you're looking for personalized support and guidance to help you achieve your personal or professional growth objectives, I offer a range of services to help. As a trusted management partner and mentor, I work with businesses in the process of transformation, looking for new streams of business, as well as M&A. With an extensive professional network of experts and mentors, I can bring on board the right person or team based on the specific needs of the company I'm working with. To learn more about the services I offer and how I can help you achieve your goals, visit my website at growandlearn.org. You can also reach out to me via email or social media. I'd love to hear from you. And if you enjoyed this episode of Grow and Learn, please subscribe to our podcast and leave us a review. Your feedback is important to us and it helps us to continue to create content that is relevant and valuable to our listeners. Thanks again for listening and we look forward to sharing more insights and perspectives with you in the future.